Good afternoon. My name is Douglas Oki. I teach drama and English here at the college. I run the theater program, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started since it's 12:20. Um, and uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, curiosity, our college theme this year, from the point of view of kind of what what it makes you think of when you think of curiosity. What do you think of? This is where you talk. <laughs> I think of the acting class that I'm in. I'm oh, curious. I never thought about that connection. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else do you think of when you think of curiosity? Just stuff that you're you're not sure about, like space and like scary stuff, like the deep forest stuff that you're not sure about. Fairy tales. Yeah. That's awesome. I think of Curious George. Nobody else thinks of Curious George when they think of curiosity? Okay, you see, yeah. And I really, really wanted to do a presentation and set it around Curious George, and I lost interest. But uh, that doesn't mean that, that Curious George isn't important, because he is. We learn a lot about curiosity and the importance of curiosity when we read about Curious George and his misadventures. Oh, that monkey. I don't know. Um, but uh, what, I did, what I did want to talk about is the different ways in which curiosity both manifests itself in our lives and in our societies, and also uh, the ways that we benefit from it. So I want to start off with this one here. Among the various things curiosity is, is it is creative. And curativity means a lot of different things, um, but it's not just the things that we often think of that are imaginative or creative art. It is those things, but it's more than that. But let's start with that. Acting, acting classes. Yes, here's part of my syllabus. Some of you uh, recognize this, the simple syllabus, which is pretty simple, um, but I, uh, I screwed some things up online. But um, this is uh, the first page of the syllabus for some of my acting classes. And I want you to uh, direct your attention to this part of it right here. The qualities of this, can you read that from where you are? Let's blow it. Okay, the qualities of a successful actor are several things, I tell my acting students. Um, fearlessness is important, of course, and you can imagine why being on a stage or in front of a film camera would be terrifying. Um, you've got to have energy and obviously discipline to be a professional in anything, you probably have to have discipline. But notice the very first one, and, and these two here can attest that, in fact, it is the very first one listed um, this is literally from our, my current class. The very first one listed is curiosity. Why is curiosity important for somebody who is going to be an actor, for example? Why do you believe that? Why do you think that curiosity is probably important for somebody who's going to be an actor? It's so far. Say it again? They don't know the okay, they don't know enough about the roles that they're playing, so they can learn more about it. Good. What else? Think about this. Yes? It's good to be curious so that you make bold choices in life. Okay, and bold it, choices. Part of, part of that fearlessness uh, thing as well. So the idea behind this is that for an actor, playing a role in a way that is um, convincing, that is entertaining, is a kind of a problem. It's a problem that we set before an actor. How do I do this? And to solve problems, you need to have the curiosity about what is causing the problem, how to uh, uh, prevent the problem, how to solve the problem. And so curiosity is an important part of any kind of problem solving. So creativity, which is linked with curiosity, is helpful for solving almost any kind of problem. Are you seeing this connection, sort of? Okay. Um, when we, when we uh, talk about creativity, well, we also sometimes ask questions like, what if? So for example, what if a zombie plague shut down civilization? This leads to things like The Walking Dead and more recently The Last. Anybody, anybody watching The Last of Us? You like it so far? Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, what if Shakespeare's Hamlet took place in the Pride of Lions? And that's the plot of The Lion King. Now you knew this. You knew this, right? That this is basically the story of Hamlet, only among uh, four-legged creatures. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's presented that way explicitly, but certainly those who, uh, who wrote the story and came up with it, they were aware of this as well, okay? Um, you know, The Lion King, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's an original Disney story, mm, sort of, okay? Um, what if uh, on one day per year you could commit any crime you wanted? That's The Purge. Uh, any Purge fans out there? 
Uh, what if there was a planet where the people are most of the time genderless? This is a novel called The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that, is that curiosity about things leads to this kind of creativity, but it also leads us to and then ask further questions. What does a genderless society look like? What does it mean to be male or female, um, feminine or masculine? What do these things actually mean? And, and Le Guin was writing about these things back in the 1960s when she wrote this novel. So these are things that, that curiosity leads us to think more about and therefore try to learn more about, okay? All right, um, in addition to being creative, curiosity is also revealing. Curiosity can learn us, help, uh, lead us to learn more about anything that's in our world, um, including things all along our own uh, individual, personal, or our, our so social or societal timeline. So let's start where we usually start in the past. Uh, critical race theory. Some of you, if you're paying attention to what happens around the, around the country, are aware that there is controversy surrounding this thing called critical race theory. Now, never mind that it, it, it is not what most people say it is, and it's not being used the way most people say it's being used. However, if you're going to talk about race in this country, you do need, in fact, to look not only at the present, you also need to look at the past. And it would be helpful to ask questions. And one of the questions you might ask is, what is the actual history of race and public policy and practice in the United States? If you actually look into that, rather than making the assumption that you already know all these things because you have looked around on the internet and discovered all there is to know about race. If instead you actually asked the question and you actually did some investigation, you would find, number one, that there were you know, dozens worth of, uh, of very long books uh, that will be and have been written about this this topic, but you would also learn more about this thing that is called critical race theory, and you would know more about what's happening in schools, what's happening in curriculum, and you probably learn things that would maybe change your mind around a little bit. A lot of people in this room are going to be very content never to ever have to talk about race. But that's not how we learn things. That's not how we make good public policy. That's not how we solve problems, okay? So the idea of discomfort is part of creativity as well. Discomfort with the things that we have to face. Discomfort with the, with the changes we might have to make, okay? Creativity comes with discomfort because it reveals things that sometimes it would be more comfortable if we didn't reveal. Does that make any sense? Okay, I'm not taking a position on anything here. I'm saying learning more because you're curious, is going to lead to a lot better decision making and a lot better problem solving. Uh, can you think of other things from the past that you might be more curious about? Our present. The US federal debt ceiling. I don't know if you follow the news. I know that probably some of you don't. But right now in the US Congress, there is a debate going on about something called the US federal debt ceiling. <laughs> If you don't know anything about this, then a little curiosity might lead you to ask a question like this one. What is the debt ceiling? When was it created and why? A lot of people think that raising the debt ceiling means that we're going to authorize more debt. That's not what it means. Imagine that you have borrowed money to buy a car. When, when that, when that uh, loan money comes due for you to pay, you aren't taking on more debt by paying it. You're actually paying your debt, okay? So the debt ceiling is not what a lot of people will tell you that it is. Now there are, there are things to be said about one way or the other, but to be creative about a problem, uh, uh, solving a problem, you need to know what the nature of the problem is. Um, what happens if we don't raise the debt ceiling and what happens if we do? If you're thinking to yourself, this is boring politics crap, what I, want, what I need you to understand is that what happens if we don't raise it would have, according to virtually every economist uh, who knows what they're talking about, is that we are going to have dire economic consequences that will affect your life. And I don't mean you, know, you generally, I mean each of you individually will be affected in some way by this. And it will affect um, economic markets worldwide. So. This is not me saying what has to be done. This is me saying to be creative about 
solving a problem, you need to know more about it. You can be in favor of something, you can be against something. You ought to have a good reason to be in favor or against something, okay? Can you think of other things in the present that might be revealed through uh, uh, application of your own curiosity about the way that the world or the things you actually work? Okay? How about the future? NASA and space exploration. Somebody talked about space, right? Okay. Um, when we talk about NASA, when we talk about space exploration, we talk about shooting things into uh, orbit uh, and to other planets and other bodies, including <laughs> asteroids. We've now landed something on an asteroid. Woohoo, look at, look at us, right? We landed something on a comet at one point. Um, a lot of people look at that and go, why are we wasting our money on that? And it's not an unreasonable question. But why are we wasting money on it contains an assumption. The assumption is that the money we, we put toward those things is, in fact, wasted. But it also helps to know what kind of a scale we're talking about. So you might want to ask, for example, what percentage of the U.S. federal budget funds NASA operations? Anybody want to venture a guess? What percentage of our total federal budget goes toward NASA? 10%. 10%. Somebody else? Point one. Point one. Somebody Point else? Point nine. Point nine. I wish I had an auctioneer voice. That would be good. <laughs> about, about point four. About about four. About four tenths of one percent. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Took all the steam out of my big reveal there. Thanks. Um, but when you ask most Americans, when people are actually surveyed about this, People um, overestimate how much we spend on NASA, and most of them say we should spend more. But right now, about 0.4%. Okay? Um, we also probably ought to ask, is there a better use for those funds? And that's a reasonable question. Um, we also might want to look at parts of the federal budget that have a larger percentage um, and ask, how much of that do we need to be spending on those things? Not unreasonable to ask those questions. We also probably ought to ask, what are the benefits we have gotten from space exploration? Now, I'm not gonna try to answer all of these questions, but if we're not asking these questions, if we're not curious about these things, then we're probably just spinning our wheels and spinning at the wall, um, which can be fun, but why would you wanna spend a lot of your time doing that? It seems kind of silly, doesn't it? Can you think of other things that are related to our future? I know, you can think of lots of things you don't want to talk about. That's fine. But before we go on, I would like to uh, um, uh, mention that uh, curiosity uh, is progressive. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, it's a political... No, when I say progressive in this sense, I mean the ways we make progress. Okay? Progressive, I know, is a political label. Um, that came, people came up with to replace the word liberal that had become a bad word. Um, but I mean it in, in the simple sense that we make progress through human curiosity. I also want to quickly dip into my archive of rejected presentation titles. Uh, as I was putting together this presentation, trying to come up with the right title, what else be? And I came up with this one. Curiosity, engine of progress. It sounds like something from a Howard Stark expo, or something, right? Um, now, I reject it not because it's wrong. Curiosity is, in fact, the engine of progress. But what a boring ass term that is. Um, so I'm not, not going to do it. But I want you to be aware that that is, in fact, uh, kind of a thing. Um, but, but before we go further into it, I want to uh, get into this idea of curiosity. And incurious is a word. It's not a word you hear a lot. But sometimes you will hear somebody described as incurious. Um, and I won't get into some of the people that have been described that way, but you'd recognize their names. Um, vocabulary.com says, the adjective incurious is useful for describing someone who really couldn't care less, who doesn't ask questions or wonder why or how something happens. Incurious people don't make good scientists, journalists, or researchers because they lack curiosity or the impulse to know more about something or someone. And I, and I, I want you to think more about that and ask you to consider for a moment is it just scientists, journalists, researchers that shouldn't be incurious? Can you think of any profession in which lack of curiosity is an asset? There isn't anything. There is no professional job that, 
that would be better done by somebody who doesn't care less. And by the way, he couldn't care less, that's correct. When you hear or when you say could care less, stop that. It's like, no, I won't have it. Um, so, so rather than being incurious, I would like you to be curious, okay? Because it's always going to be an asset to you and your job. Um, curiosity and engagement, I'm keeping an eye on that clock. Um, if you are curious, you will engage with a learning opportunity such as in your classes. Uh, if you engage, you are more likely to learn deeply. There is research to support these things. Trust me, no, don't trust me, look it up. Um, curiosity equals engagement, engagement equals learning, and it means that learning leads to success in anything, but that includes your careers. The more curious you are, the better you're going to be at whatever career or profession you choose because it's part of what makes us make progress, okay? Remember a couple of things here. What would we not have without, without human curiosity? We would have very little. We would not have medicine. Not the way we think of medicine today. We would not have technology. All of those computers that you're carrying around in your pockets, okay? Um, more powerful than the computers that sent the first human beings into space. Literally, your phone's more, more powerful than those computers. That would not exist without human curiosity. Obviously, exploration. We explore because we're curious about what's there. Um, we would not have, most of what we think of as art, what else would we not have? We would not have what we call knowledge. Curiosity leads us to know, leads us to understand. And when I talk about curiosity leading to these things, I mean not just for any individual person. If human curiosity doesn't exist, we may occasionally stumble into learning something. But if we lack curiosity, that knowledge will not get passed on to the next generation and we will literally stay where we are for eternity. And if that's where we should be, then that's probably fine, but we seem to have been hardwired to be curious. Indulge that curiosity. Don't fight it. Don't resist it. Go into your classes wanting to be engaged, wanting to be informed. Go into all of your experiences wanting to get more out of it, because that's what's going to make your life richer, and it'll probably make you richer in the long run, because you're going to be successful at your career. That's not everything, but let's not ignore that that can be happening for you too. Finally, um, I don't know if any of you know Dorothy Parker. Um, I know at least somebody in here does. <laughs> Laura Bandy smiles like every down back there. So. Um, Laura Bandy, writer, uh, poet, novelist, um, uh, philanthropist. Um, she, she did not have any heirs. When she died, she left her entire fortune to Martin Luther King Jr. because she admired his work, okay? Um, and uh, she was a humorist, and um, uh, she used to supposedly answer her phone instead of saying hello, she would say, what fresh hell is this? Um, <laughs> which I want to do in my office, but I don't know, maybe, maybe President Oldfield would have to be uh, a, little, a little opposed to that. She was very quotable, and a lot of the quotes that are some of her most famous, I can't say in front of you, but talk to me afterwards. Um, but among the things that uh, Dorothy Parker said, not really humorous, but I think appropriate for this, she said, Cure for boredom is curiosity, and there is no cure for curiosity. You are afflicted with it once you've got it for the rest of your life. And what a life, what a life a curious one is. Okay, I wish that for you. I wish you the curse of curiosity. Thank you very much. Any questions? Comments? Katava, nothing? Uh, uh... I thought you were going to heckle me, so I'm, I'm, I'm inviting Sorry. you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> 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 That's so oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.